all the attendees, uh, thank you for joining us today. To all the students, parents uh, who have joined us today, thank you very much for your kind time in uh, joining the uh, Knowledge at KPD Admissions uh, 101 workshop series. As you may, may have seen from the email I sent out earlier and uh, we've been in touch with you, um, the topic for today is why study STEM and why it, why it uh, in the USA. And we have a very special guest out here, someone who I've known very well, Ms. Stacy Reader uh, from the Florida Institute of Technology. And she's very happy to um, um, present to you about not only the session topic, but also about her esteemed institution. Um, as you have, uh, as you may know from the email that was sent out, um, the Knowledge at KPT Admissions 101 workshop series is a free initiative to connect uh, uh, the leaders in the U.S. higher education community, universities and colleges with high schools uh, here in India and students and parents uh, so as to increase direct uh, uh, engagement and direct relationship building. And uh, the format for the session today um, is going to be the first 30 minutes, Ms. Stacey is going to be presenting about the topic. The second 30 minutes, she's going to be uh, presenting about her institution. And then, of course, she's going to be answering all the lovely questions I'm sure that you must be having uh, by going through, the, uh, going through them in the Q&A section. So without further ado, I'm going to be handing over the stage and the microphone to Ms. Stacy, as uh, I'm sure she's very excited to speak to you today. And thank you, Ms. Stacy. I know it's very early in the morning out there. We truly appreciate you taking the kind time to join us. Thank you once again. Thank you, Kunal. I appreciate it. Good morning. Well, good morning for me to everybody. Uh, good evening to you. And I wanted to thank Kunal, sir, for inviting me to speak to all of you. This is quite a privilege and I appreciate it. I understand that most of you in the big cities are still under lockdown uh, here in Florida. We are in stage two of reopening. Stage two began yesterday. So both my husband and I reported back to our offices yesterday. So here in Florida, uh, stores are open, nail salons, hair salons, movie theaters, uh, shopping, restaurants, everything is open. We're just obeying social distancing. People are wearing masks and you know, staying six feet apart. So we are definitely on the road to normalcy, which feels nice. Um, and here in Central Florida, the COVID cases have not been high at all. We've been very, very blessed but we are not a big urban area either, so that helps. So um, I know many of you are from the bigger metros there in India, but from those, from some of the smaller areas, I understand that you are also in stage two, so congratulations. All right, this morning, uh, as Kunal said, my name is Stacy, and I do work at Florida Institute of Technology. I've been here in the Melbourne area for 31 years. I've worked at the university for 10, but the university has been in my life all 31 years that I've lived here in the area. So I'm very, very familiar with it. Um, just some technology reminders. Uh, please remain muted and have your video off during the presentation so you don't distract others in the audience. Um, and also write your questions in the chat box. During the presentation, I'm gonna stop um, as we switch topics and take some questions. All right, here is the agenda for this morning. As Kunal Sir said, uh, the first 30 minutes will be devoted to STEM and the second 30 minutes to uh, Florida Tech, maybe 20 minutes and then leave some time for question and answer. So these are the topics we're going to be going over today if you wanna give them a quick glance. And in the photograph, you're seeing a panther. Um, that is Florida Tech's mascot. And here in the United States, with all of our athletic teams and our academic teams, the schools tend to be represented by a character, if you will, and we call them mascots. And for Florida Tech, we're the Panthers. Why are we the Panthers? Because Panthers are an indigenous large cat to the state of Florida. All right, so let's start off with two terms you've probably heard of before. STEM, which is the most common term you've heard, and then STEAM. So STEM is an acronym and it stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. When you hear the word STEAM, it's the same thing, they just add the arts to it. Because as business keeps developing, um, we're seeing more and more STEM applications being carried over to the arts and the liberal arts. 
So you're going to hear those terms interchangeably. They mean the same thing, just STEAM has the addition of the arts. All right, so what are some of the careers in STEM? Um, since STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, these are some of the more obvious careers in STEM, engineer, healthcare, um, but what you may, uh, construction, obviously, aeronautics, military, but what you may not think of having STEM applications is business or entertainment, psychology, education, government, Every field that you can think of now has an element of STEM. At the very least, it's because we all use technology in our day-to-day -day lives. Right there, that requires some people in STEM to make that happen for us in each area of how we make a living and how we live. So careers in STEM run the gamut and um, anything you can think of will have a STEM opportunity in it. Even the ministry, if you will, has a little bit of STEM. You know, the big screens during services or the computers, et cetera. All right, why um, did the STEM areas keep growing? I think that all of us would admit that when we watch the news on television, when you're in school, when you're talking to other parents and other families, um, there's a great emphasis on studying in the STEM fields. Why is that? That's because of all the areas professionally, that's the area that has the most growth. Um, and why? It's because the world is changing so rapidly. Along with the advent of technology, it has allowed daily life to change and uh, morph very, very quickly. There's been more change in the last 40 years than there was in the prior 100 years. Um, I think of my grandmother who was born in the first decade of the 20th century. When she was born, she lived on a farm and they got around by horse and buggy and did everything by hand. She cooked dinner in a wood burning stove. And then when she died at 94, we had automobiles, airplanes, man had been to the moon. We were using the space shuttle. People had personal computers, the internet existed, cell phones. So think in her 94 years, how much life has changed. Well, in the last 40 years, life has changed even more rapidly than what my grandmother saw in the 20th century. So things are changing very quickly. So because of these rapid changes, we have needed to focus on things we've never really had to focus so intently on before. Um, the ethical and social challenges have been extreme. You know, how does one handle this technology in a moral and ethical manner? Food, the population has exploded. How do we provide enough food for the world's population? Climate change, all of these things that we're doing to grow more food, to have the transportation, to have the housing for this population growth, all of that is causing climate change. How are we gonna deal with that? With this population growth comes healthcare needs, energy needs. Uh, we already mentioned transportation and housing. Global communication, we constantly see satellites being launched into space to help with this. So we're having to really investigate and be creative with how we're keeping up with all this change and how we're meeting the needs, not just of the people in our own countries, but the people around the globe. Because everything that one country does, since we're all interconnected now, affects other countries and other people around the world. And I think that's really important to remember. For the first time, your generation is going to work completely interconnected with other people around the world. Um, I trained to be an elementary school teacher and a principal, which I did for many years. Um, if you had told me when I was your age and getting ready to go to university that one day I would travel the world and be doing presentations all over the world virtually like this and getting on airplanes and going everywhere, I would have never believed you. So business has definitely changed and it's going to continue to be more and more global. All right, so how does the employment outlook look if you're in a STEM field? Obviously, if it is the largest growth area, obviously the jobs are going to be good. Um, the data in this slide is from the US News, um, US News and Labor Report from 2018. That is the most recent data that has been crunched uh, by the US government. 
So these numbers are US, but they're pretty reflective of, of other countries around the world, because as I said, we're not taking any step backwards when it comes to technology. So employment in the STEM fields has grown 79% since 1990. So it's gone from 9.7 million jobs to 17.3 million jobs. And that is just in the United States. So the STEM fields has outpaced all growth in all fields. So if you're thinking of a STEM career, your job opportunity and job outlook is very, very strong. Interestingly enough, and we're gonna focus on this in a little bit, 45% of all of those STEM jobs are focused on computer and computer related jobs. Um, that shouldn't surprise you because most everything we do now does involve technology in the form of computers um, and high speed communication, but 45% of the jobs are in computer related fields. And interestingly enough, since this presentation is taking place in India, when I first started coming to India for the university 10 years ago, um, when I would attend fairs or visit schools, the most popular majors that students asked me about was mechanical engineering and medicine. Now when I am in India, this has been the case for about the last four to five years, I would say 90% of the students that I speak to want computer science or computer information systems. So that has changed a lot and that right there is indicative of what's going on in India and where the jobs are. All right, now take a look at this last slide, uh, the salaries. And the salaries in the STEM fields are also the highest salaries. Um, the average salary in 2018 was 86,980 US dollars. And the average in other fields that are non-STEM were 38,160 dollars. So the average salary is more than double of the salaries in other fields. Again, these are US numbers. So your country would be slightly different but I do think the trend is, is consistent across the globe. Um, the pictures in this slide are, are interesting. They are local pictures. This is what happens locally in Melbourne, and we're going to talk about that later. Um, we are the space hub of the United States, so STEM jobs are huge here. All right, please take a look at this cartoon because I think it's really, really cute. This is the first day of school in an astronomy class at a university. And notice all the students are very, very interested and look at their question. Look at the professor's answer. And now, now look at the classroom. It's empty. And I use this cartoon because I think it's very apropos to the STEM fields. If you're going into the STEM fields, you need to love mathematics and you need to be good at mathematics. So if you don't love math, if you don't like math, love math, and you aren't very good at it, maybe the STEM fields are not gonna be for you because a, a strong math background is very, very important. And I bring this up because um, many of you in the audience are still in high school, or you are high school counselors, or you're the parent of a high school student. So, if one wants a career in STEM, what are the subjects you should take in high school? Um, please understand that when you're looking at fields of interest of what you want to study, particularly if you're going to a specialty university like my own, where it's focused on certain fields, um, having the right background is important. Um, yes, your overall GPA needs to be strong. Yes, you need to be a well-rounded individual. But if you're going to go into something specific or go to a specialized university, specific academic background also matters. So as I mentioned, if you're going into a STEM field, math is the most important class you're going to take in high school. Um, how do you prepare for it? Take the highest level math that your school offers, but challenge yourself or you can still be successful. Don't take the highest level math and then get a miserable grade or mark in that class, but challenge yourself by taking the highest level math you can while still being successful. That success is important because you want to master the content of the class while challenging yourself. Um, if you're going into engineering or computers, 
Most universities want to see pre-calculus as a minimum for high school mathematics. Um, physics is very important. That's the next most important class in most STEM fields. So if your high school offers physics, make sure that you take it. The next most important class is chemistry. Um, again, not all fields in STEM are gonna require chemistry, but many of them do. Um, I have biology and environmental science and computer or IT and italics for a reason. Um, biology is going to be more important than chemistry if you're going into one of the life science oriented STEM fields, such as uh, biomedical engineering or bioinformatics or biomedical science. So in that case, physics and math are still your top two subjects, but then biology would replace that chemistry as being important. Um, if you're going into environmental engineering or ocean engineering, um, environmental science, then if your high school offers any environmental science classes, that would be more important than the chemistry. If you can take chemistry and environmental science, that would be great because there is a lot of chemistry in environmental science, believe it or not. And then of course I mentioned that more than 45% of the jobs in STEM are in the computer fields. So if your high school offers a computer or any kind of IT course and you're interested in studying computers, do take that class. Number one, you need a background. You need some kind of foundation. Number two, make sure you like it before you devote four years of university into studying it. So though, that's how you prepare yourself in high school in STEM. Of course, in high school, you're gonna to have to take other classes. You have to take um, you know, history. You're gonna to have to take a literature. You're going to have to take a foreign language, um, probably some classes in the humanities, um, et cetera, et cetera. But these classes, math, physics and then one other science are important to take and take a math and a science all four years of high school if you're going to go into a STEM field. All right, we've talked about STEM and STEAM. What questions can I answer about these specifically what we've talked about so far? I am going to go into the Q&A because I see a few questions. Okay, here's a question. Does economics qualify as a STEM major? And how can I combine this with computer science? That is an excellent question. Um, economics on its own generally does not qualify as a STEM major. It's considered in the business area. Um, if the economics program has a high content of computers and mathematics, statistical analysis, et cetera, some schools may qualify it as a STEM subject. So it will vary from school to school, but in general, economics is not considered a STEM major. Um, how can you combine this with computer science? Easy. You can do this in one of three ways. You can do a double major. So you could major in both computer science and economics, or you could do a major and a minor where you major in computer science and minor in economics. Don't do it the other way because computer science is a very technical field. You want that to be your major and economics to be your minor. Or you could get a computer science undergraduate degree, take some of your electives in business, and then get an MBA with a concentration in economics um, following your bachelor degree in computer science. So any one of those three routes would work. Um, one thing to think about, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, is um, your STEM fields can be very, very technical, particularly computers and engineering. So oftentimes you don't have a lot of room in your schedule for electives, but you will need a business background in the business world. So to go on and get an MBA or an engineering management master's degree is often a very good pairing. So whoever, uh, it's, uh, let's see, Supriya, you asked that question. That is an excellent question and your brain is moving in the right direction. I'm really proud of you for thinking that way. All right, there's a second question by Rush and he's asking, is it a pre-requirement to take maths in 11th and 12th grade to pursue biochemistry? And yes, it is. You're going to need at least pre-calculus to get into that uh, major in college. So do take math in 11 and 12. Um, universities that are admitting STEM students want to see four years of math between grades 9 to 12. All right, any other questions on the first portion of our presentation?
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and continue with the presentation then. Um, next slide is, all right, um, why would we want to study STEM in the United States? And how do you go about finding the right fit in your universities? Well, um, you wouldn't be in this session if you weren't interested in studying in the United States. And your interest in studying in the United States is probably based on the fact that a university education in the USA is still considered the gold standard of a, of a college education. Um, the United States offers the most flexibility in what you can study. It offers the most flexibility and creativity in how you can combine what you study. And um, the education system in the United States also offers the most opportunity for work experience, both during your college education and after your education in the form of OPTs. Um, another reason is because there are more colleges and universities in the United States than in any other country in the world. Currently, uh, the United States has over 4,700 accredited colleges and universities in the United States. I know that college in India is often used to describe the school where people take um, grades 11 and 12. That is not the case in the United States. In the United States, the terms college and university are interchangeable. The only difference between colleges and universities is usually um, the way that the university is set up administratively. Um, and oftentimes colleges don't offer the graduate degrees where your universities will offer bachelors through PhD programs. Um, again, in the United States, um, that's something that is rather unique is you can study interdisciplinary fields. So as um, I believe was Sarita asked before about economics and computer science, you can combine different interests more easily in the United States. Um, other factors that make the United States um, a very attractive place is that we have a very large number of different degree areas that you can study, and that is appealing to many students. Um, the colleges and universities that are in the United States come in all different shapes and sizes. In the United States, we believe education should be accessible for everyone. So anyone who wants a university education, there is a school that is suited for them. I can't guarantee whether they will be able to afford it and if it fits the family budget, but there is a school that would fit that kind of learning style and that kind of student. And that's what makes the United States very attractive. Is there something for everybody? Um, so you have very, very large institutions, which can go up to 98,000 students, and very, very small ones that are 1,000 students or so. Um, the location, the United States is a big country and different climates within the United States. We go from Florida, which is tropical, all the way to New England and the northern tier states that border Canada, which have four very extreme seasons. And then the middle of the country, um, those latitudes have more milder four seasons. So we have a wide variety of locations. Um, we also have some very large metro cities like you have in India. And then we have medium-sized cities like you have. And then we have small villages and towns like you have. So we have universities in all of those areas. There is a great diversity among the people here in the United States. The United States was, is a land of immigrants. We were settled by immigrants over the last 400 years. So when you're in the United States, it is a rainbow of colors, a rainbow of people, a rainbow of languages and customs and cultures. And I think that diversity is very comforting for a lot of people. It's simply who the United States is. Um, at United States universities, that diversity is also reflected at the universities. Um, it directly mirrors the population of the United States and its diversity. Um, there's a lot of student organizations in the United States. In the United States, the model of universities and colleges is for students to live on their campuses. Um, so students in the United States tend to leave home at 18 and then go on to university. And there they, most of them live at their university while they're transitioning from childhood to adulthood. Because their lives take place on the university, there's a lot of organizations um, to help develop some of the softer skills and help develop your interest areas and your social life. So that's really important. Um, as I mentioned, most students live on campus at United States universities, so it's a safe, a very safe way to transition from childhood to adulthood. And it um, provides an area, a way for students to get uh, independent quickly. There's athletics for everybody at all levels. 
and internship and job opportunities. Um, keep in mind that for many of you, because things are changing so quickly, the job that you're gonna be working in may not exist yet today. That's how quickly things are changing. So it's really important that as you educate yourself, you educate yourself for the future and you allow your brain to be flexible and you also learn as many soft skills as possible. Our right, engineering is probably the biggest area of STEM and you see the four traditional areas of engineering. All of you have seen that, but we also have some newer areas that have developed in the last 40, 50 years. Aerospace, uh, biomedical, I'm not going to read the list to you, but all of these things um, are relatively new in the last 40 or 50 years. So these are some newer areas in engineering. And then, of course, at most universities, the computer fields will be found within the College of Engineering. Um, so let's focus on computers and their application. Um, big data is a, is a hot word right now. Big data is uh, the large name that means computer science, information technology, data analysis, et cetera. If you're gonna go into big data, um, then 100% of the jobs are gonna require an, a bachelor degree. 73% um, of the people who currently work in big data have a master's degree and 38% earn a PhD. So the bachelor's degree is necessary if you want one of these good jobs. Master's degree and PhD is not necessary, but that master's degree, obviously, if 73% of the workforce has one, um, is highly attractive. PhD degree, um, I remember somebody telling me once that there's two reasons to have a PhD degree. Number one, if you want to someday teach at a university on a full-time level and be tenured, you need a PhD. I have a master's degree, but I taught at a university, so you can teach at the university with a master's degree. You just will never be tenured and probably not be brought on full time. Um, and then the other reason for earning a PhD is because you want one. Um, it's always been a lifetime goal of yours. That would be the other reason. Um, here are some good minors. This goes back to that first question. Some good minors for technical degrees are computer science, statistics, physics, social science, mathematics, applied math, and economics. So right there, Saria, you see the economics would be a good pairing with your computers. Also on the screen are some um, fields that, these are some majors you might see universities offer that are all in the big data area. And different universities call them different things, but these are some of the more common terms you will see. All right, data science, big data. Um, Again, these job outlooks, if we look at that, this is based on the year 2018, the U.S. Department of Labor and Statistics. This is the um, average salary. By average, we're talking about all of the people in big data in the United States who are at the median stage of their career, so 20 years into their career. They're earning about $110,000. Um, all computer-related occupations earn approximately just under $80,000. If you have nine years of work experience plus your degrees, then you could be earning up to $150,000 annually. And if you're going to be one of, in a leadership position, a data team manager, look at the salary that you could possibly be making 20 years into your career. All right, so data science, it's applicable in every field. Data science is taking large amounts of data and manipulating it, studying it, manipulating it. So um, it deals with statistics. Um, in business, you'd identify trends. It would help you plan your products and your manufacturing. You'd be looking for hidden patterns to help you with your sales and your manufacturing. Forecasting future business opportunities and marketing. What are some personality traits that would make a good data analysis? Clearly someone who likes math. If you don't like math, this is not for you. But for those of you who like math, here are some other good personality traits. You should be curious. You need to be highly organized, highly focused. You need to be able to look at small, small bits of details and then put them into a larger picture or look at a large picture and then break it down into very, very tiny details. So being focused and highly organized is really important. 
you've got to be stubborn. Many aspects of this field can be frustrating because you are working with very large amounts of numbers and breaking them down into smaller pieces. So when you get frustrated, you have to be stubborn and stick with it. Um, again, and have a high tolerance for frustration. You have to have acute attention to detail. So if you are not a detail-oriented person, and I am not one, then this prob field probably is not for you. Even though you're working with numbers predominantly every day, all day, you also have to understand people because you're using these numbers to see how people would react or how your business can bet best meet the needs of people. So you need to be able to understand people, have an affinity for people. You need to have an understanding of business and marketing and how that works because much of the number crunching you're doing, the statistics and the analysis is now going to be applied to the business world through your company. So you need to have a good understanding of that. All right, so we've talked about STEM and all the fields, the liberal arts. The liberal arts are careers that are not in science, technology, engineering, and math. All of the rest of those fields are considered liberal arts. They have more of a humanistic feel to them as opposed to a science and number driven feel to them. Um, anything in the liberal arts is a great double major or a minor to go with a STEM field because that liberal arts major will help develop some of your soft skills and some of the skills you need to apply your STEM talents to the business world. Um, and these transferable skills, again, are creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, and communication. Those are all integral skills for success in any field. And it is studying subject areas in the liberal arts that really helps develop these areas. All right, we mentioned that business. Um, that first question asked about economics. If you're going to combine this business with STEM to get into big data or a data science field, focus on networking. Meet as many people as you can, make as many contacts as you can. For all of us, our network is our key to getting jobs and promotions throughout our careers. Do as many internships as you can. Um, here's some good combinations of business and STEM, uh, business analytics, data science, economics, financial technology or financial engineering, uh, CIS, and IT. Um, here's areas in innovation that require STEM. And then also you have design that requires a STEM background. So all of these areas are in the business field, but require a STEM background. Healthcare obviously is in the sciences. Um, you're used to the pre-professional two-step program. In the United States, it's different from India. In India, you come out of high school and go directly to medical school for five years. Here in the United States, it does not work that way. It's a 10 to 12 year process, if not longer. So students get a bachelor degree in anything. Usually it has to do with the sciences, but it can be in anything. And then they apply to medical school or dental school or veterinary school. Um, the traditional areas that you've heard of in healthcare are medicine, obviously, pharmacy, dentistry, veterinary medicine, and psychology and psychiatry. Um, then there are some newer fields that are popping up in the United States and elsewhere, and that is physical therapy, occupational therapy, physician's assistant, and rehab sciences. And those newer areas also have this two-step approach. You get a bachelor degree in something, usually to deal with science, and then you go on to a professional school in one of those areas. Some other modern options in healthcare are listed to the right of the photograph, um, and you've all heard of these, but these are some of the newer areas that are not a two-step process that you would study directly as an undergraduate, and you could also go on and get a master's degree in these areas. All right, questions about STEM or studying it in the United States? I'm gonna look in my questions and answer box. And yes, there is one. What are popular liberal arts minor options a student can typically take? Um, anything, really. I would focus on subjects that uh, will lead you to have good uh, analytical skills, uh, synthesis skills and people skills, communication skills. So maybe something in business, something in psychology, something in um, communications. Those would all be excellent minors or double majors for your STEM major. That's a good question. Thank you. Anything else?
All right, I've got about 20 minutes left. So now I'm gonna focus on Florida Tech. Florida Tech is Florida Institute of Technology. And we are located in Melbourne, Florida. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Florida has a tropical climate, so it's warm and humid all year long. We are a small, private STEM institution. So when I mentioned at the beginning of the program, you have um, uh, uh, focused institutions like fine arts institutions. We are, we are designated as a STEM university. All of our degrees are in the STEM fields. Um, we are located in Central Florida. So those of you who've ever been to Orlando or heard of Disney World, if you've been in Orlando or you've been watching you know, Disney World on television, we are one hour east on the Atlantic Ocean. So if you were to drive your car one hour east to the ocean, that's where Melbourne is. We are right beneath Kennedy Space Center. So this is the home of the United States Space Program. NASA is located here. In fact, NASA is the, uh, the people at NASA are the people who started Florida Institute of Technology back at the dawn of the space race. At that time, there were no space degrees offered anywhere in the world. So the engineers and scientists and astronauts at Cape Canaveral needed advanced degrees and advanced classes. And so they created their own university, Florida Tech. We also have the United States Space Program here, SpaceX, Blue Origin, and the United Space Alliance. We have uh, global multinational aerospace companies Harris, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, GE, Lockheed Martin, and Brer, which is a Brazilian company, Thales, which is a French aerospace company, DHS, and many, many more. And we have a small startups and medium national companies too. Melbourne, Florida, and Cape Canaveral, if you connect the two to Orlando, that is the United States' fourth largest high-tech workforce. So a very talented technology STEM-oriented workforce. In addition to this wonderful high-tech a STEM oriented business community. We are minutes away from some of the world's most beautiful beaches. Um, you've heard, I told you already that we're one hour from Orlando. You've heard of Miami probably. We are three hours north of Miami. And then you may have heard of Tampa. It's another big metro in Florida. And we are three hours across the state from Tampa. And if you don't know where Florida is, Florida is the peninsula that dangles off of the bottom of the east coast of the United States. It is the vacation capital of the world. More people travel to Florida than any other area in the world for vacation. All right, Florida Tech is not only renowned for STEM, but we're also renowned because we are the United States' second most international university. A full one-third of our student body is international. So you would fit right in. We do international very, very well. And um, our international students last year came from over 120 different countries, including India. You see an example of some of the flags that the countries come from in this building. This is out at the airport. This is the lobby of our facility out at the Melbourne International Airport where we train our flight students. Florida Tech is made up of four colleges. We have the College of Aeronautics, in which we are world renowned. Uh, we've just finished training all of Turkish Airlines two years ago, and now we are training the pilots and the dispatchers and the ground control personnel for Saudi Arabia Airlines. Um, so we are ranked one of the top aeronautics programs in the entire world. Definitely we're ranked in the one, top one or two uh, in the United States. We have a College of Business, and we have a College of Engineering and Science, and then we have the College of Psychology and Liberal Arts. Um, we are most famous for our engineering and sciences. A full 70% of our student body is in this college. Um, so obviously as a STEM institution, this is what we do best. The College of Psychology, we are one of the top three programs in the United States in clinical psychology. It is excellent. We offer forensic psychology, clinical psychology, applied behavior analysis, and animal sciences. In liberal arts, we don't offer a whole lot. We offer two communications classes and a pre-law major in the liberal arts. Um, but we are very much renowned more for our engineering and sciences. And I've included photographs from all four colleges there on the slide. All right, something different about Florida Tech from other universities is we direct admit into specific majors. So rather than do two years of prerequisite coursework and general education coursework, 
Our students actually apply to the university for a certain major, and they start taking classes in that major their very first semester. And that is a unique approach to education um, in the United States and around the world. As a result, our students learn very actively in what they're passionate about. Um, you are, it's a very hands-on, very active education. You are personally involved in it. You're going to be doing research. That's a requirement for graduation as an undergraduate. Um, we applied discovery, applied learning, co-ops, internships, teamwork. All of what you need in the business world is what you do all four years at Florida Institute of Technology. And here you see some students who are building a car from scratch, and they will probably race it um, in some Baja or streetcar competitions around the country, perhaps even internationally. But this is one of our buildings where students can work on their projects. For students in the College of, actually in any college, for the students in the College of Technology and Science, we have a formal pro, uh, pro track co-op program. And this is a hybrid program that combines work experience with the classroom. Um, it's a formal program in which you have to take certain classes and take certain seminars to be ready for it. You still graduate in four years, but you will have three opportunities to work for three different multinational companies here in the Melbourne area, and they will actually pay you to work for them. Um, the salary is between ten dollars to $11,000 a semester. So you'll do three paid semesters in your four years for three different companies. And if you've done a good job, you should have three job offers when you graduate. Um, most of our students who do this program are hired um, at the end of the program. We also have a fast track option, and that is if you wanna combine a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, in do both in five years rather than six years. It saves you a lot of time, saves you a lot of money. Uh, in the business world, we have an MBA in which you can accelerate your MBA and do both your bachelor's and your MBA in four years or five years. Again, those are very accelerated programs. Both the ProTrack and the Fast Track are not for everybody. They are uh, very, very rigorous, to say the least. I, I mentioned that the education here is very hands-on, very immersive very learn by doing. Um, we have student design projects and everyone in the College of Science and College of Engineering must do a senior design project. You begin it in the middle of your junior year and then in your senior year there's what I call the science fair for big kids. We call it the um, April Senior Design Showcase and what I'm going to talk about in a little bit is job opportunities. We have two hiring events every year this senior showcase has turned into a third hiring event. Employers from around the United States have realized the talent at Florida Tech and they will send representatives to the senior design showcase and hire students right off of their projects. We have many corporate relationships. NASA is obviously one and all the space programs. Um, but we also have Larson Motorsports. Larson Motorsports is a jet dragster company that races internationally. And they're headquartered on the Florida Tech campus. And our students, they hire about 25 of our students for internships every year in all disciplines, psychology, business, science, engineering, and aeronautics. And they all work together in teams to create the cars for this racing team. And here's the Florida Tech car that races internationally. Interestingly enough, this company, their driving team is all female. All of their drivers are female and the company is owned by a female. So this is a really nice opportunity if you are interested in getting into automotive or um, megatronic, something like that. All right, I mentioned that we have two hiring events. We have a hiring fair every fall and another one every spring. Also, as companies are in the area doing business, um, in any college town, they like to interview college students and get some new talent for their company. These are the multinational companies that come to Florida Tech twice a year to interview, at least twice a year, I should say. Um, you recognize all of these names. Embraer, obviously, um, is based in Brazil, but they have a, a plant here in Melbourne. They hire a lot of our students, particularly our Brazilian students. So these companies hire our students, and these students, because they are multinational companies, 
often go work all over the world. So when you are hired at Florida Tech, it does not mean necessarily you'll be working in the US. One of these multinational companies could ask you to work in India or France or Brazil or the United Arab Emirates, who knows? Then of course we have much smaller companies that also come to Florida Tech to hire. All right, what is the admission process for Florida Tech? Let me tell you that for bachelor degree students, it is absolutely free to apply. There's no application fee. You can do our own application, which is found on the homepage of our website, or you can do the US Common application, either one. Once you've submitted your application, we will need you to submit your transcripts. In India, that is gonna be grades nine, 10, and 11, because most people apply to universities at the beginning of grade 12. So I want to see if you're in an Indian curriculum, I wanna see your CBSC or your state board results in grades nine, 10, and 11. And yes, I do understand what happens in grade 11 in India. Um, if you're in um, an IB curriculum, I wanna see your grades nine, 10, and 11. Uh, you won't have your IB results yet, but you will have your first year of IB results already in. If you're in an AP or Cambridge curriculum, again, O levels for Cambridge, and you will have finished your first level of a, your first year of A levels, which is your AS. So I want to see your O level results um, or IB, IGCSE results, if you want to call them that, and then your first year, your AS levels. If you're in AP, you're going to have um, a regular curriculum, grades 9, 10, and 11. You won't get your AP results to the end of grade 12, and that's normal, so don't worry about that. Um, if you are a US citizen or dual citizen or permanent resident, then we do require the SAT or ACT. If you are not any of those, you are a citizen of another country exclusively, we do not require the SAT or ACT. So for most of you, the, these tests are gonna be optional. I do wanna see an essay. Um, I wanna learn a little bit more about you than is simply on your report card and in your test scores. Please limit it to one page, no more than one page, and tell me something that makes you unique. Um, I don't really wanna hear about the best basketball game of your life, but I do wanna hear something that's personal to you that makes you unique. And then one letter of recommendation from one of your teachers. Um, I do get the question, can my letter of recommendation come from my mother or my father or my sibling? The answer is no. I know they love you unconditionally and think you are wonderful. I have no doubts. Um, so therefore the letter of recommendation does need to come from one of your teachers. Anyone, you pick that one. Um, if English is not your first language, you do need to submit proof of English proficiency unless you're in an English speaking curriculum like IB, Cambridge, or AP. And many of the schools in India are English medium schools. If that is the case, just get a letter on your school's letterhead that states it's the language of instruction is English and that will suffice. Um, I keep mentioning um, different curriculums. If you're in one of the curriculums that are more advanced, such as advanced placement, IB, or Cambridge, then we do give advanced credit for some of those classes. If you get a four, five, six, or seven in your HLs and IB, we will give college credit for that. If you get a four or five in AP, we give college credit. And anything you get at A, B, or C in your A levels, we will give college credit for. That means those are classes we give you credit for taking, even though you're not taking them on our campus. You come in with college level classes that will help you possibly finish your degree sooner, which saves you some money and some time, or it gives you the flexibility to have a double major without a lot of stress. This is our typical admitted student. Um, we admit 60% of the people who apply to Florida Tech, and then about 30% of them enroll. This is the average weighted GPA on a 4.0 scale. This is the mid-range of the SAT scores of both math and the writing, the reading and writing. And then this is the average of the SAT, the composite score. So you can look at your own profile and see how you fit in with our typical enrolled student. These are not minimums, this is an average. And we do get over 11,000 applications a year. I think last year we got 13,000 applications. We do give scholarships to international students. 90% um, of the students on this campus, whether they're international or domestic, get a scholarship from the university. 
At the international, it's called a Partial Academic Merit Scholarship or the Panther Fund Scholarship. And these go up to $16,000 a year. Whatever you're offered in scholarship is automatically renewed every year until you graduate and a bachelor's degree is four years in the US, as long as you maintain a B average or higher. If your grade average falls beneath the B, which is a 2.6, then you will lose your scholarship. So this is incentive. It's a reward for doing well in high school and an incentive to keep your grades up. We also have legacy grants. If your parent graduated from Florida Tech or you have a sibling currently at Florida Tech, you get a little bit of a discount. Uh, performance grants. If you wanna be in a performance group, sometimes they will give you a little bit of money to commit to that group, such as cheerleading or pet band. Um, if you're a transfer student, we also have scholarships for you. We have athletic scholarships. We're NCAA Division II. Um, I get a lot of questions about athletic scholarship. Don't fool yourself. To get an athletic scholarship in the United States, you need to be an elite athlete. That means that you would play, you're, you're playing your sport at the level where you are either nationally ranked or you would play for your uh, national team or maybe try out for the Olympics. That's how good you need to be. And then for everybody, there's on-campus jobs. They're very competitive because everybody needs money, but there are lots of jobs on campus. This is the cost of the university broken down. Um, this is the tuition and fees for science and engineering, and then the other areas, which are business, aeronautics, and psychology. Um, the science and engineering is a little bit higher because your laboratories are more expensive. This is room and board. Remember, you will live on campus and that includes a meal plan. And then your incidentaries like books, health insurance, pocket money is approximately $5,000. So you're looking at a total every year of between $54,000 and $58,000. But again, 90% of our students don't pay that much. They get a scholarship. And again, the highest scholarship for international students goes up to $16,000. So that total cost is greatly reduced for more students. Most students, excuse me. All right, this photo, anyone know what this is? Where we're located is called the United States Space Coast. We're Florida's Space Coast. And this is how close we are to the launch pads. That is a rocket taking off from Kennedy Space Center. And that was, picture was taken from the top of a second story building on our campus. Those lights in the distance are the Cape. And uh, very, very base of that, you can see the lights from the launch pad. All right, now I'm gonna open it up for questions and answers. We have about six minutes left. So I'm gonna open the question and start answering them for everybody. When our time ends and Kunal will turn us off, I will continue to answer questions um, through typing. But right now I'd like to answer as many as I can. Feel free to follow us on social media if what I've said interested you. So next question. Uh, this is from Balkrishna. What are the minimum credits I need to qualify for STEM if I've taken a business major and miss? I don't know what and miss means. Um, you don't have a minimum credit if you want to qualify for STEM. It's the subject areas. You can transfer with any number of credits. So let's say you started university in India and you finished one year you can transfer some of that credit to the United States. And how that works is you would apply to US universities as a transfer student. If you have more than 26 credit hours, we don't need to see your high school results. If you have less than one year, we do need to also see your high school results. Um, in many cases, I ask to see them anyway because I'm looking for trends in, in your abilities as a student. But once you are admitted to your US universities, then um, the university will examine each class that you took and the syllabus for each class and compare them to the university's classes that are the same. And if the syllabi is the same and you pass the class with a C or higher, you will get transfer credit. If you didn't get a C or higher, you got something lower, it will not transfer. Or if the syllabi don't match up, you may have taken chemistry one, for instance, but what your professor at your university covered is different from what our professors covered, then you won't get transfer credit. So it does depend on do the classes match and how you did in them to see what transfers. 
One thing I can promise you is that not all of your credits will transfer. They never do. And that is the case for all universities all over the world. None of them take 100% of another university's coursework. So just be prepared for that. Um, what type of courses? Again, your math-oriented courses are going to be the most valuable if you want to transfer and get into a STEM field rather than business. All right, next question. What majors are offered in the School of Aeronautics? Okay, that's a good question. The majors are uh, aeronautical science, aviation meteorology, um, aviation management, and human factors and safety. All four of those majors, you can take one of them. You can take them with or without the flight option. The flight option means that you want to become a commercial pilot um, and fly for a commercial airlines. If you take the flight option, it does add about $20,000 a year to the price of your education. Flight is considered a hobby by everyone around the world because it's not required to earn a living and it is a very expensive hobby. If you have never flown an airplane and um, you wanna become a commercial pilot at Florida Tech, that will take you two years. And you take your flight at the same time that you're studying for your degree program. And um, your last two years, you'll have already had your commercial pilot's license. So the price is now gonna reduce because you've already got your commercial pilot's license. So now you're going to be earning your flight hours so that you can be hired by an airline. But you don't have to take flight if you want to study something in aeronautics. There are plenty of people who work in aviation who do not fly. So you don't have to take the flight option. So that's why we offer all four of those majors either with or without flight. And again, adding flight will add about $20,000 a year to the cost of your education. All right, next question from Ashna. Can we as undergrad students pursue assistantship such as teaching or research? No, you cannot. At all universities, teaching assistants and research assistants is a graduate level job. Those are not available for undergraduates. And internships, are they during the course or summer vacations? It can be either. Um, if you do our formal co-op program, they're going to be during the school year. Most students prefer to do their internships during the summer simply because they enjoy university so much and also they want to graduate on time in order to be, be most economical with their time and their money. So most students choose to do internships during the summer, um, but you can do them at either time. And where do you do them? Obviously, wherever you can get them. And what's different in the United States from India is in India, a lot of universities can promise you an internship or a job when you graduate. In the United States, that's not true anywhere. No one's going to promise you anything but they do help you a whole lot, help you develop your uh, skills with resume, interviewing, wardrobe, dining, everything you would need to land that job. And uh, every school has a career services department, and that's the department that helps you prepare to enter the workforce, and it also brings companies to campus for interviews. Next question is from Akash. Is OPT longer than one year for students majoring in STEM programs for bachelor degree students? Yes, you can do an OPT after an associate's degree, after a bachelor's degree, or after a master's degree or a PhD degree. As long as it is a terminal degree, you can do an OPT. If you are in a designated STEM field and your particular university will tell you which majors at that university are have designated STEM by the US government, then you can serve a three-year OPT. If you're in a non-STEM field, um, then such as psychology or education, then you can serve a one-year OPT. So STEM is three-year and non-STEM is one year. And again, at the end of an associate's, bachelor's, master's, or PhD. Next question is from Dipali. Which program qualifies for ProTrack and will I be able to graduate on time? ProTrack is for students in the College of Engineering and Sciences only. And yes, you will graduate on time if you go straight through without taking any summer breaks. If you take a summer break, it will take you a little bit longer to graduate. 
but it is designed, that program is designed to have those students finish in four years. Can you go over again the starting salaries for your STEM majors taken by most of your students? I have to correct you there. This is Viren. Viren, the statistics I put on the screen are by the US Department of Labor and Statistics, and they are for the United States as a whole. Those are not specific to Florida Tech. I will put that slide back up so you can look at it. Um, let me find it. I believe this is the slide you're looking for right there um, because the data science salaries were higher than these. These are not specific to Florida Tech. This is again a US average. Um, Val Krishna, I've already answered your question. What are the majors offered in the School of Aeronautics? We've already done that one. Um, can a letter of recommendation, this is from Sneha, can a letter of recommendation at FIT be submitted by my school guidance counselor? Yes, it can. It needs to be somebody who sees you in an educational setting. So a teacher or your high school guidance counselor is fine. For scholarships, what would the range be for bachelor's degree? Um, bachelor's degree is the only level we offer scholarships at. So the range is from $10,000 a year up to $16,000 a year. And that is for this current school year. Every year, the universities in the United States determine their pricing and scholarships. So that is determined on an annual level that could change from year to year. Um, <clears throat> rarely do I see prices go down. If anything, they go up. Um, at Florida Tech, whatever we offer you when we admit you is what we will give you each year, all four years of your university degree, your bachelor degree. It will not increase. It will stay the same. Uh, Val Krishna, would it be possible to share more information on campus life, clubs, and activities? Yes. Um, one of the things that makes the United States such an attractive destination for university students is the level of clubs and activities found on university campuses. <coughs> Excuse me. And the best way to answer that is to tell you there's something for everybody. At Florida Tech, we have over 100 student organizations and clubs, and they cover the gamut of everything you can think of, from academic clubs to international clubs, to uh, food-oriented clubs, to anime, to technology, to sports, to um, animals, any interest students have, there's a club for that. And if there isn't, there is a, um, the student, the dean of students has seed money that he will give you that you can start an organization. Um, I'll give you a, a, for instance, about seven years ago, I had a young lady from New Delhi and she was really into street music and hip hop dancing. At the time, Florida Tech did not have a hip hop dance club and she was really into it. So she and some of her friends um, decided they would like to start a student club for hip hop dancers. And they approached the Dean of Students, he loved their idea, and so he gave them some money and they've started, they started a club. Now it's 2020, she graduated about seven years ago. And that street dancing club is still at Florida Tech and it has about 50 members right now. So as far as clubs and activities, there's something for everybody. And if there's something you're particularly passionate about at your university and it does not exist in the form of a club yet, you can start it. And then the next half of that question is, how can students be involved in extracurricular activities during their four years of studies? Easy, you simply sign up. Um, at the beginning of each semester at most universities, all the clubs and activities have a table and they lay out that their members are behind the table and the new students come through and talk to all the clubs they're interested in to find out, you know, when they meet, if it costs money, what they do, who's involved, and then you just simply sign up for the ones that interest you. You're going to find university campuses to be very welcoming and very diverse. So nobody's going to want to exclude you for any, from anything that you really want to do. Next question is from Chaitan. Does Florida Tech waive English proficiency requirements for Indian high school students, class 12? We waive English proficiency only if you are in an English medium curriculum or school. If English was not your first language, let's say it was Hindi, 
and your school is a national school and all of the classes are not taught in English, then you will have to take a TOEFL or an IELTS or Duolingo exam. However, if you're in a national school and all of the classes are taught in English, you can simply get that in a letter on the school letterhead and we will waive English proficiency. If you're doing Cambridge, AP or IB, we waive English proficiency because those curriculums are only in English. And from Supriya, can you please go over the classroom learning experience? Ugh, that's a hard one because everyone's experience is gonna be different. Um, I mentioned that we direct enter into a major, so your classes are going to be uh, directly related to your major for the most part. There are classes required by law that you have to take in order to earn a university degree. We sprinkle those classes throughout your four years. Uh, you have to take a certain amount of humanities, philosophy, general science, um, science devoted to particularly your field, um, communications classes like reading and writing. So, but we sprinkle those throughout your four year. You'll probably take one of those every semester and the rest of your classes will be related to your major. Um, all of the classes at Florida Tech are taught by full professors. You will not have a teaching assistant or a graduate assistant actually teaching classes. They will, however, may be leading laboratories or assisting in the classroom, but they will not be teaching you. <coughs> classes do have some lecture to them but a lot of actually learning by doing and project work. And of course, you do have exams. It is a school. All right, next question, um, Akshaya. I would like to learn more about campus safety in general and also due to COVID. Excellent question. University campuses in the US are, are pretty safe places and say, actually they're very safe places. All universities have their own campus security, which is their own police force, if you will. And also, um, should the campus security force need backup, they do call the local police force who shows up instantaneously. So campuses are very safe. There's also something called the blue light system. These are big yellow poles with a blue light at the top. And all college campuses have them located all over campus. And if you ever feel threatened or in danger, you would simply go to one of those yellow poles and there's a, a, a dial pad on it. If you touch that and hit the dial pad, you can, there's a screen and the security force can see you immediately and they can come help you and send somebody to you. Um, also, each college campus has a, an emergency number at Florida Tech, it's 811. When you dial that on your phone, you're immediately connected to campus security and they will help you in any way they can. Whether it's giving you a ride to your car or escorting you from your lab in the middle of the night back to your dorm, or if you heard a strange noise and you want them to look into it, they will come. So they're very accessible. Um, college campus is very safe. Again, you have young people who are there to learn. So the student body itself is usually, you know, they're not criminally oriented. Um, Melbourne itself, we are not a big city. We're a medium sized city. We have about a half million people in Melbourne. In the entire county, there's a million people. So be and then I mentioned that we're the nation's fourth largest high tech workforce. That means it's a very highly educated community. Crime and poverty are very closely linked. So the more poverty you have in an area, the more crime you have. Melbourne, because of the high level of education, does not have a lot of poverty, therefore we don't have a lot of crime. I tell students that in general, as long as you are smart and make good choices, nothing bad will happen to you in Melbourne or on Florida Tech's campus. However, if you are a stupid individual and you make very, very poor choices, something bad is definitely gonna to happen to you wherever you go. So if that helps you, um, now let's address COVID. Um, we did close along with the rest of the United States uh, in March. We are now reopened, as I mentioned in the beginning of the program, we're in stage two. I reported back to the office yesterday so we're at half capacity now with employees at the university. Um, summer classes were offered virtually, so our students are scattered for the summer. Some are still on campus, but they're all taking their classes virtually. In the fall, we open um, on August 8th, 9th, and 10th, and we are having face-to-face -face classes in the fall. We are arranging our classrooms so that the desks are six feet apart. 
and our professors are going to be teaching more sections of each class in order to accommodate smaller classes and our classes are small anyway our average class size is 20 to 25 students so classes will be even smaller and also each student who's living on campus is going to have their own room so that they don't have to share during covid when the threat of covid does end you will be having roommates again because that's generally what people want in university it's a lot more fun that way um, it's a lot more comforting that way to be a far away from home to have a roommate or apartment mates but during this covid everybody is going to have their own room um, we have erected plexiglass barriers in high traffic areas between personnel and students um, we are requiring people to wear masks when they're interacting with each other. We also have hand sanitizers all over campus, which we did before COVID. We had hand sanitizers everywhere anyway. So we are taking all the precautions that uh, people all over the world are taking, but we are having face-to-face -face classes starting on time in the fall. I hope that answered your question thoroughly, Akshaya. About Bal Krishna has another question, but I've already answered it. It's about the English proficiency and waiving it. Um, Raul, I would like to know more about AP credits. All right, clearly then you're, you are taking AP classes if you're asking that question. Um, if you get a four or a five in your AP courses and that course is required for your major, and it may or may not be because different majors require different courses, um, then we will give you college credit. For instance, let's say you took Calc AB, AP, and you got a four on the Calc AB exam. When you get to Florida Tech, we're gonna give you credit for Calc 1 and put you right in Calc 2, but give you credit for Calc 1, meaning that's a class we're giving you credit for that you're not paying us for and you're not taking. That is how AP credits work. Some AP classes, some departments will take a three. So um, again, it depends on your major and what AP classes you're taking, but if you earn fours or fives, and in some instances a three, we will give you college credit for that class. Melind has a question. Uh, do you require international freshmen to live on campus for the first year? Actually, we require all of our students who are undergraduates under the age of 21 to live on campus their first two years, Melind. And then how does me housing and meal plan work at Florida Tech? If you're living on campus, you have to have a meal plan. Uh, your freshmen, we require you to have one of two meal plans. One is three meals a day, seven days a week. The other is 15 meals a week. They cost the same. 15 meals a week, although it costs the same as the other, gives you more flex cash on your card. And that's something you'll, it works like a debit card where you can purchase things on campus with points or money that's on your card. Um, so it, unless you're an athlete getting up at five o'clock every morning to work out, you're probably not gonna want breakfast. You probably will keep breakfast in your room in your refrigerator and every room does have a refrigerator and a microwave. So my guess, I counsel students to buy the 15 meal a week. That means you have lunch or dinner, you have two meals a day in the dining halls. One day of the week you'd have three but you'd have more flex cash on your card where you could buy groceries in the campus grocery you could get a smoothie or a salad or pizza or a sandwich and and pay with your flex credit and let's face it look at your own family you know before the coronavirus you know you probably went out to eat at least once a week or got takeout you do the same in university so for many students again unless they're an athlete getting up at four or five o'clock in the morning to work out most of you don't need three meals a day. You'll keep snacks in your fridge and probably most teenagers like to sleep in. You'll probably sleep in and grab a yogurt or a piece of fruit and head off to class at the last minute uh, for your first class in the morning. So I would suggest getting the 15 meal uh, meal plan and meal plans and housing are often combined. Um, at Florida Tech, we do have five different dining options on our campus. Um, we're kind of like a cruise ship. I've noticed that food is served on this campus in at least one venue for 22, uh, I'm sorry, 20 out of the 24 hours of each day. So only between the hours of 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. is food not served somewhere on our campus. So uh, mothers who are listening, you don't have to worry about your child getting enough to eat. 
there's plenty to eat. At Florida Tech, because we're such a diverse student population, we have every single um, dining option has veg and non-veg. So vegetarians have plenty to eat also. If you have a food allergy, you can speak to the chefs and they will work with you as far as your allergy. Notice I said allergy, not a preference. <laughs> a preference you can choose to eat, you know, choose to buy what meals you want. Um, but an allergy, we will work with you. All right, Dipali asks, said she'll be taking a gap year. What would be the requirements for the gap year? Um, when students take a gap year, universities want to see that you are doing something productive. And quite honestly, with the coronavirus, many students are taking a gap semester or a gap year. That has become way more common this year. Um, we are going to ask you what you did during your gap year. Just make sure it's something that you did for yourself that gives you some personal growth, an internship, some volunteer work, maybe taking some classes you always wanted to take that your school never offered, uh, maybe learning some traditional dance and you never had the opportunity to do that, um, learning a new skill. Just what we don't want to see is we don't want to see that you sat home on your couch and played video games for a year. That's what we don't want to see. So do something productive that, and that extends your personal growth. Um, and yes, you can mention the gap year in your essay and talk about it. That would be very personal towards you. I think that would be an excellent topic for an essay. All right, Ashna is asking, in terms of importance, what do you give more weightage to for admissions? Transcripts, letters of rec, test scores, or essays? Every university, the answer is the same, transcripts. The way you perform on a day in, day out basis is most important. Right up there with transcripts, though, in India are test scores. Because you take state or national boards, those scores are very important. I would say they are equally as important as the transcript. What is less important is the letter of rec and the essay. We use those to get an idea of who you are as a person rather than a student to help determine if our university will be a good fit for you. Never forget you're going from one educational institution, your high school, to another educational institution. So grades are always gonna be the most important aspect of the application. What is the minimum, uh, this is Rahul, what is the minimum IB requirements, point requirement for admission? As I mentioned, Florida Tech is a specialty institution. We're STEM oriented. So we don't look at total IB. We look at the IB courses that you took and what level you took them at. We want to see for, I'm gonna use an engineering student or a computer student as an example. I want to see math, physics, and chemistry. You need to take them at um, the HL or SL level. Um, some of you who are older who had the math option, the math studies option, I won't accept math studies. You've got to take it at HL or SL. Um, so I'm looking for A's and B's in math, physics, and chemistry or biology, depending on what area of STEM you're going into. For the other areas, math is still your most important subject. I want to see that at HL or SL. And um, for business and psychology students and aeronautics students, Aeronautics, I'm looking again for math and physics. That's really important. Um, for the rest, I'm looking for math and then a nice selection of classes across the curriculum with, if your high school offers it, a class related to your major. For instance, a business class, if you're gonna be a business major. Maybe you took AP Psychology if you're a psychology major. Maybe you took a computer class if you're gonna study computers, but definitely math. Um, so I'm looking at the courses you took in relationship to your major, what level you took them at, and what you earn in those courses, Rahul, rather than a total IB score. Because a total IB score, a student can do really bad in math, but do really well in a lighter subject and have a high IB score. That's why we don't look at the total score. Uh, Harry is asking, what would the student faculty ratio be? It's about 1 to 14, Harry. Um, with the COVID, it's going to be a little bit smaller, maybe 1 to 12, because the classes are going to be much smaller. All right, Bal Krishna is asking, it's an 11th grader, wondering if next year's admissions will be more strict due to the current scenario. No, sweetheart, they will not be. Uh, universities have their standards, and they're going to stick with their standards. 
um, they will not be more strict to the coronavirus. If anything, universities are going to need students and they might be even a little more lax because a lot of students are staying home for the first semester due to COVID. So you, you don't have anything to worry about because of the COVID. It is not going to make it harder for you to get into university. All right, Viren is asking, uh, would you be able to share more details on your current Indian students? Yes, I can. Um, India, China, and Saudi Arabia are our three biggest international populations. Any given year, one of them will be number one, two, or three. It does change from year to year. Currently on my campus, Saudi Arabia is my largest student population, followed by India, then China. Um, excuse me, let me. Um, um, most of the Indian students are graduate level, um, but I probably have, oh gosh, at least 20 undergraduate Indian students, at least. And um, I have 200 and something Indian students on this campus between bachelor's and PhD. So there's a lot of Indian students um, and they come from all over India. Um, obviously, a lot come from the metros, but some of them from smaller regions, too. That's about all I know for the details, though. I know that they don't have any trouble getting non-veg food and that they really like school. Can I share my email address? Yes, I can. It, um, it is, and I'll type it at the end also. It's admissions at fit.edu. And then my personal one is S Reader, which is my last name, S R E E D E R at FIT.edu. But I will I will put those in writing at the end of the questions. Um, and one last question. This is the very last question, and then I'm going to call a halt. Um, and it's the last question listed anyway, so it's perfect. This is from Bal Krishna. Again, 11th grade entering 12th grade. Wondering if admissions, oh, I already answered it. They will not be more challenging, Bal Krishna. Um, if anything, it will be the same or even a little more flexible. So I wanted to thank all of you for attending today's session. I hope it was valuable. Good luck as you pursue your STEM degrees and good luck as you get look for OPTs when you graduate. And thanks again, stay healthy during this. And I hope that uh, all of our lives begin to open up and return to normal. Good luck to you. I look forward to working with you if you apply to Florida Tech, and I hope you do. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Stacy. I, I wanted to truly appreciate your time uh, for taking in so many questions. I know we extended the session, but uh, really appreciate your kind time and joining us today. Uh, for all the students, I really hope um, you were able to, um, um, you know, get all the answers to your questions. And as Ms. Stacy has posted her email address in the chat box, Please ensure these questions and these conversations continue to happen even after long after this workshop. And I know it's very early in the morning. So really, thank you so much to Ms. Stacy and also to all the students, parents, and guidance counselors who attended our session. Last but not the very least, this session is recorded and will be shared with high schools across India. So please be sure to check with your guidance counselor uh, for more information on this. And it will also be pasted on our social media pages. I would like to uh, cap for today by just launching a quick poll uh, for those of you who are still online. And if you can just share your feedback in terms of how did you find this session to be, and that will really, really helpful uh, for us to get some feedback. So the question for the day is, did you find this session useful? Um, I know some of you are planning to log out, but if you can just take a quick minute of your time, that'll be really, really helpful. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly um, end it. Stacey, can you see the poll results? I can. Actually, I can't see the results. I just see the question. I don't see the results. Okay, so out of, um, or out of uh, 15, can you see the results? I'm so sorry. I'm not able to hear that. No, sir, I cannot. Okay, so out of 15, we have had about 10 uh, individuals who have, I think, uh, answered this, and they all say, uh, yes, so thank you so much for making it so informative. I truly appreciate your kind time. Oh, and uh, let me see if you can see the results. Are you able to see it now? The results? 
No, I can't see the okay. results. I don't know. I'm so sorry. You, they usually okay. pop up in the this. So we have had uh, 10 people who have answered and all 10 have said yes. It was very useful. Oh, good. I really appreciate uh, your uh, kind time. And thank you to all the attendees for taking the time to answer, to ask all these questions. And uh, please be in touch uh, with Miss Stacy after the session. And I wish you a wonderful day, uh, Miss Stacy. And to all the attendees, I wish you a wonderful evening. To everyone, please take care. Stay safe. See you hey, may I say one thing, Kuno? Yes, absolutely. Please go ahead. All right. For those who wanted the email addresses, I accidentally deleted that question, but I'm going to put my email addresses with another question. The question is, what would the student-faculty ratio be? I'm putting my email ad addresses there because I answered the question. So there you go. I just sent it. Thank you, Kunal. Thank you. I appreciate you. it. And to all the students, please have a look at the question asked by Hari. Uh, that's the one we have uh, Miss Stacy has posted her email address at. She's posted both her email addresses. Uh, please, uh, please uh, go uh, into that question. If you just scroll a little bit up, uh, the question by Hari has been, what would be the student faculty ratio as Miss Stacy Reader said? And that's where she has posted the answer. So I'm just going to stay online for a quick minute, just so that everyone can write it down. And uh, it was really enjoyable to have you today. And I wish you and your family, Miss Stacy, the very best. And please take care and please stay safe. Thank you, Kunal. I wish the same to you and all the students. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, take care. Bye-bye, right. everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.